Rules Committee will come to order. Thank you very much. Uh, this afternoon, we will consider H.R. 3964, the Sacramento San Joaquin Valley Emergency Water Delivery Act, and H.R. 2954, the Public Access and Lands Improvement Act. H.R. 3964 addresses the emergency drought in California, and we've all become aware of this. We've seen our colleagues and communities in California that are suffering as a result of the lack of rain. And this uh, opportunity to redirect water to farmers and communities in the Sacramento San Joaquin Valley is important. On January 17, 2014, the governor of California declared a state of emergency due to the drought. The lack of rain call has exacerbated the longstanding man-made drought caused by federal regulations and environmental lawsuits. These regulations have sought to protect the Delta smelt, which is a small fish, by diverting over 300 billion gallons of water away from the farm communities that rely on water to grow their crops, to take care of their families, and to feed America and the world. As a result, thousands of farm workers have lost their job in hundreds, jobs in hundreds of thousands of acres of fertile farmland have dried up. This common sense jobs bill puts farmers back to work while ensuring that substantial water resources are preserved for environmental purposes. The second bill before the committee today, H.R. 2954, is a bipartisan package of 10 smaller bills. The package promotes public access to lands, removes regulations that stand in the way of job creation, and encourages community-centered land management. I just saw you on TV. What was I doing? <laughs> well, I was waiting for you up here, and you walked in the front door, and I was at the side door. I want to thank the uh, young chairman of the, uh, uh, the uh, Resources Committee, Natural Resources Committee, for coming up two straight days, not just to the Rules Committee, but also his... Uh, his former committee where he still stands as the favorite son of the Rules Committee. And I want to thank you for coming back, and I would yield uh, at this time for any opening statement the gentleman from Florida would choose to make gentlemen recognized. The gentleman does not have an opening statement, but uh, I will offer in defense of the committee that we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, Grace, we're going to have you please join uh, Chairman Hastings. Uh, if you would like to be on this first panel, do you want to? Yep. Then I'm inviting you to come join us right there. That chair right there. This will make Doc look so much oh. better with oh. you there. She always tries. Thank Ms. you, Ms. Mr. Chairman. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please do remember that anything you have in writing will be entered to the record. Uh, and without objection, we'll accept that. Also remember, pulling your microphone as closely to you it does help us. Uh, we uh, welcome the chairman of, of the committee at this time. Gentlemen, is recognized. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman Sessions and ranking, members, ranking Member Slaughter, for holding these hearings on these two important bills, H.R. 3964 and H.R. 2954, and I'll speak to both of them since they're yes, both sir. on the channel. Uh, on first, on 3964, the Sacramento San Joaquin Valley Emergency Water Delivery Act, this bill would help restore some water supplies and provide job certainty to struggling farmers and communities in that part of the country. California is facing an emergency drought situation and urgent action is needed to address this crisis. The lack of rainfall has, has exacerbated the man-made drought caused by the federal regulations and lawsuits that put the needs of a three-inch fish above people. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, on January 17th, Governor Brown of California declared a state of emergency for California because of the drought. This, is a, this bill is a comprehensive solution that would restore some water deliveries, would ensure a reliable water supply for people and fish, would protect and secure private property and senior water rights, and save taxpayers uh, money by ending unnecessary and dubious government projects. I want to remind everyone that we are here today considering this bill because of the Senate's failure to act. While we took action in the House, in the, in the Congress, in the last Congress, the Senate did nothing. And the situation, because of lack of Senate uh, movement on this bill, the last Congress, the situation is now dire because of that inaction. 
The hardworking people of California's San Joaquin Valley cannot wait any longer. We must act now to address this emergency situation, restore the flow of water, and provide immediate relief for struggling families, farmers, and businesses. This legislation is introduced and is supported by the entire California Republican delegation. And so I applaud my California colleagues for the work on this uh, legislation. I know how difficult it is to get uh, that many people on board, but they all are on board. On 2954, this too is a bipartisan package of 10 bills that have passed out of the Natural Resources Committee. These bills protect and promote public access to lands, improve opportunities by removing red tape that stands in the way of responsible local economic development and jobs, and encourage transpar transparent community-centered land management. This grouping of bills would advance important, lo important local projects that will have a direct impact on jobs and economic growth in, community, in uh, communities throughout the country. It includes several common sense land conveyance bills to remove unnecessary bureaucratic strings attached to how land use is used and managed. There are measures to prevent federal regulations from blocking reasonable access to Cape Hatteras in North Carolina and prevent the use of hand-powered boats such as uh, kayaks in several national parks out west. It will improve and streamline the process for renewing livestock grazing permits and require BLM to establish an online database for all BLM lands that are available for sale to the public while limiting all future land acquisitions until this database is fully up and running. Finally, the bill will expedite the planning and implementation of emergency salvage timber sales for federal lands in California that were ravaged by the Rim Fire in the summer of uh, 2013. Without prop emergency action, the impacts of this devastating wildfire would become even worse. And the reason for that is that salvage has a value after the fire, but that value diminishes over time. And we're getting to the point where that diminishment uh, is such that if there's no value, then it becomes fuel for future fires. This is a very straightforward piece of legislation. So thank you uh, very much for your consideration of both these packages of bills, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. We're delighted that you're here, and thank you very much, Mr. Paltano. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Slaughter and members. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify and for giving me the great honor of coming up uh, in, before uh, my colleagues are involved in this uh, that are sitting in the back of me. Um, all of California is in drought. Uh, it is the third straight drought year. This driest in the record of California um, since, uh, uh, I don't know, decades now. Uh, we all need to work cooperatively. We need a bipartisan solution for all of California. That includes Southern California. This bill does nothing for Southern California. Um, uh, past water bonds back in the 70s and 80s, um, Bay Delta uh, assistance, the, the, all of those levy funding, they all favor Northern California. I don't particularly take exception to that, except I think a bill like this ought to be considering all of the state of California. We are in all of us are in drought, not just Northern California. We want to be included in the dialogue, uh, also in water conservation and water recycling, desal education, so that we can continue to advise and educate people about how to conserve water, that precious resource. The Sacramento-San Joaquin Valley Emergency Water Delivery Act was introduced one week ago. No hearing, no markups. It was very partisan, uh, introduced only by four of my colleagues, uh, Northern California Republicans, with no meaningful conversation or cooperation with the rest of California. Uh, the bill is patterned, as was stated before by my uh, chairman, uh, Hastings, uh, H.R. 1887 from last Congress, where it died in the Senate. It, this bill repeals historic California water rights and water law. It is a terrible, horrible precedent to infringe on states' rights that may be used as an example in other states. Uh, it reallocates water for junior water rights holders above the senior water rights holders in the Central Valley and ignores Southern California water users and disregards endangered species product protection while privatizing a public resource for a very select few. Uh, it repeals years of careful balanced water compromises and legislation. It does not create any new water to relieve or solve the drought. Mr. Chair, I request permission to submit letters in opposition, uh, and I have them here. The first one is from Governor Brown, State of California Governor Brown, from the California Department of Water Resources, 
from 34 California environmental groups from the Western States Water Council who opposed the same provisions in the last Congress for preempting state water rights. Also, I'd like to add that H.R. 2954, the Escambia Lands Package, is from the Natural Resources Committee. Collection of the 10 bills, nine controversial Republican bills, and one Democrat from Washington, preventing the historic Green Mountain Lookout in Washington State from being removed. 2954 is unbalanced and puts industry and development at odds over conservation values and protection. Many of these bills weaken environmental protections, dictate land management decisions, convey and dispose of federal land, and rewrite grazing policy. The so-called lands package ties the hands of land managers who work to ensure that the lands are used for a variety of uses that benefit the American people and completely disregards the view of all stakeholders over a few minority interests in waiving public input and judicial review. The Democratic leadership of the Natural Resources Committee opposes 2954, and I believe all the Democratic amendments offered to date, the 3964 and H.R. 2954, have merit. And I do respectfully ask for full consideration. Thank you, sir, and I yield back. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I want to make sure I heard the gentleman right. She said it will add not an additional ounce of water. Is that what you said? That I'm sorry. The bill, that the bill would not add one ounce of water? Correct. To the, <coughs> Correct. the health, health issue. Mr. Chairman, um, it's, it's our understanding that the bill, the San Joaquin bill, would could add up to 300 billion gallons of water to be, to be made available. Is that, that larger than zero? Uh, that is. And let me, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, e elaborate a little bit on uh, what you. I said briefly and, and what uh, Mrs. Uh, Napolitano said. This bill is virtually identical to H.R. 1837, which passed last year out of the Congress. There's four amendments that are really, uh, I guess, local in nature, and, but, they're, but they're all good amendments. But it's essentially the same piece of legislation. And the reason that I emphasize that we're here today because of lack of action in the Senate is that the Senate has not moved any California water bills. The frustrating part that I think my California colleagues have uh, is that we recognize that under our system of government, we have two houses. One house has to act, and the other house has to act. And if there's difference between the two, you work out the differences. We're willing to do that. In the last Congress, we passed this bill. Now, all we have heard, very frankly, and I'll be very, uh, I, some, some will probably take this as, uh, as not very nice, but I will say that all we have heard is lip service from the, uh, uh, the uh, senators from California. Uh, Senator Feinstein has said, I'm going to introduce legislation and thus and so. Okay, introducing legislation doesn't count. Passing legislation counts. When you pass legislation, then you have an opportunity to look at that legislation. Now, I am glad that Senator Feinstein has finally said she's going to introduce legislation. I think she said as early as this week, maybe as late as next week. Frankly, that's two years too long, but I welcome it. Now, the next step, if we are successful in putting this on the floor and passing it to the Senate, the next step is for the Senate to pass their legislation. And if it's different than ours, fine. We'll work out the differences. But to send out uh, these missives all the time that this is totally unacceptable is unacceptable to me. It's unacceptable to me because that's not part of the legislative process. And I'll, I'll reiterate again. Introducing a bill is not enough. Passing legislation is what we're about in the Congress. And that's why this legislation is once again uh, in front of us this year, because of lack of action in the Senate. Had the Senate passed anything last year, we probably would have been in conference. There was a drought last year in California. We could have, probably could have worked out the differences. But we haven't had that opportunity because they haven't acted. So this is... Uh, I, I know that probably my uh, California colleagues can speak much more compassionately than I, but I think that's what bugs them. Well, and they have been. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Nunes, and the gentleman, Mr. Valadeo, among others, have uh, spent, uh, Mr. McClintock, have spent a great deal of time making sure that I got closer to the issue three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, and now. I'd like to go back, if I can, 
do you anticipate that there, that this will add any water if we followed what you were saying? Ms. Napolitano says not an ounce. Well, yeah, you address that for it, me. It will. Let, let me let me address this, and, and my California colleagues can address it better. When when this crisis first came about, they suggested a very short term uh, effect that would immediately uh, loosen up some water, uh, and that was rejected out of hand by the Senate. I.e., that's why we're back here again. So this is probably more of a long term solution. But if I'm not mistaken, and somebody can correct me, it comes up later on. It will it will provide water immediately, and I am right on that. Yes. I can't tell you how much, but I know when you're flushing that many gallons down downstream, yes, there's going to be water available. I I don't I don't know why we'd be here if it didn't provide some relief of water, because I think that's where the battle is. By the way, uh, we're not immune. Anybody that lives in the country in the central, uh, south, or west, I live in none of the three. I live in Texas, but we live in in a in a land that is dry and desperate. So I have great respect for what you're trying to do. Mrs. Fox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate our colleagues being here today. Um, probably about 35 years or so ago, Time Magazine had a front cover showing the land parched and cracked and saying, you know, we're running out of water in this country. I grew up carrying water. And I'm probably the most sensitive person in this body about the use of water because of knowing what it's like not to have water. And I've been very sensitive to this issue for a long, long time. And I think Americans for too long have taken um, our water, our wonderful abundant water, for granted. And I, I think it, we have to do something to get people's attention, that we have to be better stewards of the get great gifts that God's given us in our natural resources. So I thank you all for what you're doing here and for attempting to solve some of the problems. We can't solve the weather problems and the drought problems always, but we can raise the awareness of how we can do a better job overall of husbanding the resources that we have. And so I wish all of you, particularly in California, well as you deal with the challenges of what to do with water. It, it's it's going to hit this entire country one of these days, and uh, sooner rather than later, I suspect. But thank you all for being here. I have no questions. Joe, I'm yields back time. Joe, I'm New York's recognized. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I thank all of you. I uh, Obviously, the Rules Committee has been dealing with Central Californian water as long as I can recall. Uh, and it's never gotten any better. And Mr. Hastings, uh, what I love what you said is we're here to pass legislation. Oh, I wish that were true. Uh, 75, 80 percent of the bills we come up here and know the Senate is never going to look at those. That's a one house bill there we saw one. I think this is. But I do uh, question, is, if, do I understand that you're to take surplus water from the rest of California? Is that it? Where is the surplus water in California? Well, I, probably the best definition of sur surplus water is water that's not flushed down because of, uh, of an uh, endangered species ruling. That would probably be the best surplus water. I, I heard that uh, Congressman George Miller said this morning, I didn't hear him say this, but some of, of my colleagues in here may have, that there were areas around his part of California that already have no water. The taps are not working. It's all being trucked in. God help them if they have a fire because they don't even have drinking water. Is that correct? Well, I, I understand that's true. I know Mr. Nunez has told me this last week that there are two communities in his district that could be without water potentially. So, And I believe the governor has said that they're six or eight weeks away from a serious problem throughout the state. I'm not, I'm not sure of his time frame, but, but he, he, he said it was an emergency. I take him at his word. Now, uh, I do have a quote here from John Laird. He's the Secretary of National Resources, State of California. Uh, quote, this bill falsely holds the promise of water relief that cannot be delivered because in this drought the water simply does not exist. Do you not agree with that? Well, Mrs. Slaughter, if I may, huh? uh, I'm not going to say that is an incorrect statement, but there has to be a solution. Now, if there's a, you know, the collective wisdom of the California Republicans is that this is a solution. 
That's their collective wisdom. You're now, if there's a collective the wisdom, if I may. Collective wisdom, though, is it, to get surplus water. Yeah, I is, want is, to make is sure to, I understand to, that. Yeah, and, and in the long term, have more uh, more water storage and then have prioritiz prioritization of that water use. I think that all goes together. But the point is, you can wring your hands and say, we have no water. You can make declarations. What is the solution? This is a solution. If the Senate has a solution, put the solution out and pass it. But they haven't even done that. Right. We're, we're trying to do the work in the U.S. House of Representatives on behalf of those people that live in the San Joaquin Valley in California. So wringing your hands will not get you more water. And that's exactly what that statement says. Wringing your hands. Because it does not exist. Is what nope. the statement says. It does not exist. Yes, we have a low slow pack if we can prioritize and run. But, the, but you have to think long term. This, this has been building up for some time. In my well, opening I statement. Know. I don't think there's been a lot yeah. of long term thinking about this. Every time nope. that okay. I, it's come before the rules, it was some last minute and let's help some part nope. here and not the rest of it. Uh, in, all due respect, in all due respect, I'll give the Californians a great deal of credit. Uh, 40 or 50 years ago for managing how they can utilize that water and transfer it right. to other parts of California. All of California has benefited from that. But the priorities go have gone away. The priorities have gone away from people. And when you ha take priorities away from people, then you'll have these ensuing uh, uh, shortages because of the droughts that happen on a regular basis. But that plan that you mentioned, this legislation repeals existing law regarding the use of water in California reallocates the water in a way that elevates junior water rights, which I'm not clear I understand, um, above all other water needs, including municipal, fisheries, and environmental uses. If enacted, H.R. 3964 would set an unprecedented standard of state preemption, environmental disregard, and the privatization of a public resource for the benefit of a select view. This legislation creates no new water. Does that make uh, is that a good summation of the bill? Well, no. It's, it, no it's, <laughs> or does it create new water, Mr. Hastings? Well, let, let me put you know, I mean, there, there's a, you, you know, you made a long statement there, and California water law is not uh, black and white. It could be somewhat complex. But I will we'll say that there, uh, the, one of the reasons why California is in this mess, from my perspective, is because of previous preemptions of state law. This seeks to this the, this bill here and the bill we passed in the last Congress seeks to remedy that preemption, mm -hmm. uh, and that and that's why I'm I'm sure that's probably why that's in uh, your talking points there is uh, is for that reason. Well, it's just a statement I had here, not really a talking point, but I would uh, it, I'll be finished in just a second, then I yield to you, Mr. Yeah. Hastings. I want to quote Senator Feinstein. Uh, she says she's drafting. This came from the Sun Herald. Um, she's drafting her own drought legislation. She called the GOP bill disingenuous, irresponsible, and profoundly dangerous for California. She said she told uh, three of the members of Congress from her delegation last week that she would like to work with them on a proposal that could pass. Uh, instead, she said they're recycling the broken ideas they have championed for nearly three years. Mrs. Slaughter, let, let, me let me respond to that. All right. She said... I assume that's a recent statement that mm -hmm. she was willing to work with him. Where was January she? January 29. Good. That's even more recent than I had hoped. Where was she two years ago, when the California when we passed out of this house HR 1837 that would be a long term solution? Yeah. I don't remember her sitting down then. Any statement saying sitting down with the California delegation and work out whatever it is, because, of course, the Senate had not passed any legislation. So how do you negotiate when the Senate has not passed any legislation? But this bill's only six days old. No, this, 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 this uh, apparently you weren't here when I first uh, made the observation. This is virtually identical to the bill that passed out of the last Congress. Yes, it was introduced, uh, this, this Congress, just last week. Mm -hmm. And we're moving it because this is a dire emergency. But we have acted on this legislation and contents of this legislation uh, in the past Congress. But as I think uh, Congresswoman Napolitano pointed out, there have been no hearings, no uh, discussion on it, and apparently it was just three guys from California. Is that about right? Well, let me let me let me let me, let me respond to the, let me respond to this. That's we a big we are ha we are out there. We in New York watch it very closely. We are today having more of a discussion on California water law than the Senate has had in the last three years, in the last probably ten years. 
the discussion we're having here today is much more profound than where the Senate has been. And you can't pass legislation unless you have both houses. Well, I, uh, I think I've, uh, let me now yield to Mr. Hastings. Thank you very thank much, Thank you, Mr. Charles. Hastings, for waiting. No, Ms. Slaughter, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to address the point that Chairman Hastings made about preemption. Uh, my read of uh, this particular law is that it preempts California law. And I just heard you say that it's intended to remedy preemption. Uh, distinguish that for me, if you can. Uh, Mr. Hastings, if I may, uh, it, it has to do, and if, if somebody can correct me, uh, uh, it'll come up here later on, uh, maybe Mr. McClintock, I know we're involved in that discussions, but if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, it revolves around uh, California water rights and overlapping federal water rights on California. In other words, uh, in the West, there's a first in time, first in, uh, first in time, first in right. That's a kind of a, a water law. I'm sure California has that. My state of Washington has. If I'm not mistaken, when they overlap the Central Valley Project, which is a federal project, it overlapped California water laws. That was a preemption. Now, I'm, I, I hope I'm correct on that. And this, this is, am I, I'm correct on that? At any rate, that, that's, and somebody can correct me if that's not the case. Oh, All right. Well, I won't take more time. I'll have time. And thank you, Ms. Lauder, for yielding uh, to me for that question. Mm -hmm. Mr. Palatown, do you want to? Thank you, yes. And uh, I, I just a, a few points to clarify, or at least to add my two cents, is that uh, junior water rights is, is uh, in California, the water rights were given to the first Native Americans. They are the first rights, water rights holders. And then they went to those that helped produce either a Hoover Dam, uh, um, a funded so they could have water from the Hoover Dam uh, for farming. Uh, then it went to farmers, et cetera. And then the, the ones that came after were the junior rights. So in essence, if all of you are given junior rights, he could essentially come up and say, get out of my way. I am the first rights holder. So it, it moves that, those, um, how would I say, status, if you will, of assistance in delivery of water. That's what junior rights holders are. And these individuals, including uh, some of the uh, very wealthy farmer uh, cooperatives, cooperatives uh, have uh, wanted long to get in and become first rights holders rather than junior rights holders. And that's part of the problem. The second uh, area uh, is the preemption. Um, the uh, June th uh, 13th letter of, of 2010 from the uh, um, Western States Water Council was strongly in opposition because they recognized, and as Mr. Hastings was pointing out, that it does set precedent for other states to preempt water rights by allowing junior rights holders to step in and move all legislation, all agreements, everything that's taken decades to formulate to be able to do what needs to be done for the state, the state allowing its, state, its, its own rights rather than federal stepping in. Uh, and we talk about allowing states to, to uh, be able to have their own ability to do what they need to do. This is a perfect example. And so to be able to say that uh, we want to take the Northern California, reduce and, and, and uh, kill all the amendments, all the um, uh, rights, uh, all the agreements that have been made for the, the last four or five decades is something that is going to only benefit legal counsel. I'm sorry. That, that's where I, I would come from. Now, a lot of the, the, the dialogue is water. It is allowing um, water that he owns, but he wants it, allowing him to take it from him, being able to usurp some of the uh, uh, rights to that water. And that's how you are managing to get new water. Now, if you're looking at other areas such as uh, um, Storage above ground, I'd rather have below ground because you don't have the uh, uh, evaporation rate of 15 to 20 percent. And also you're able to have aquifers be able to take in recycled water, et cetera. That, that's another story. But we all feel that we need to work together, yet I have yet not had one individual come and talk to me about whether or not I agree or disagree on this particular bill or on any other bill for that matter that has to do with California. And I've been in the subcommittee 16 years. So I, I would love to work with somebody, but yet I'm not given an opportunity, and you too, sir. <laughs> I really appreciate being before this committee. Thank you so much. I, we have a <laughs> relationship. Friendship. Friendship. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen, yields back her time. I won't ask the difference between those. 
but we'll uh, we'll maintain. Very marked, and don't get into it, sir. I don't want you to. Uh huh. Gentleman from Utah is recognized. <laughs> um, Mr. Hastings, let me try and, and just follow up in here. You know, I think we're getting hung up on some kind of semantics here. Um, the question was asked you if you are taking surplus water. There really is no surplus water. What you're talking about is diverted water, water that's diverted from one purpose and putting it trying to trying to put it into a more meaningful use. That would be a better way to describe that. Um, we, we have a saying in my state that it's better to be head of the ditch than head of the church. Um, with no disrespect for you good people in Southern California, your water comes from Utah, so no, you're using our water here. Yeah. I know, and you're trying to take more all the time. It's not you'll be Nevada, but it's still our water. Let me ask you two other simple questions here. You know, the, it was said last week by someone, I can't remember who, that there is a purpose for government as long as government is effective, efficient, and uses common sense. If I can get off this one and look at the other bill for just a second, you have a provision in here for transferring land in Anchorage, Alaska. The total land that is being involved is 2.65 acres in the center of Alaska. Are we to the point of national government that we actually have to pass a congressional bill to transfer 2.65 acres that are not being used in the middle of Anchorage, Alaska? Yeah, for clarification, that is not in the California Water Bill. That is in the other bill. So I'm, I'm, yeah, just I'm jumping to the, right. to the good bill. Yes, that is true. As, you, as the gentleman well knows, uh, serving on the committee, uh, we, yeah, we are charged with all transfers. And this, this is a uh, – and, and as a matter of fact, uh, I know uh, in your state you have uh, – I think it might be 10 acres uh, that uh, has a similar interest. So, uh, yes, uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, I, I understand. I would not, by the way, use of that land would not fall under, the, under your definition of uh, government, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I, I also got 40 acres that the Forest Service didn't know they had transferred over to communities so they could have a, 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 an expansion of their cemetery. Right. But that was okay, because it only took me four years to get that accomplished. Wow. You can easily do that. Since that is the length of time we have to play around with these particular issues, can you just address the Green Mountain Lookout bill for a second on why that is so significant now? Well, that was a that lookout uh, was part uh, of when that was a national forest, and uh, and there were times you know 40, 50 years ago people would spend summers out there looking out for forest fires and they call back forest fire and all that. That got that got to be part then of a, a different designation. I think a part of a wilderness area, but but the forest uh, the lookout stayed there. So now what happens, because it's a different designation, uh, I will say it, the purists say, oh, gosh, we've got to move everything that was ever man-made out of that area. I'm over-exaggerating, obviously. And there are others that said, wait a minute, this is a historic lookout. Let's preserve it there. And uh, the local people want to preserve it. And so that's the reason for that legislation is to preserve that lookout. So as I understand, uh, they were sued yeah. uh, by the Wilderness Watch which is not a local organization. It's a national organization. Yeah, that happens a lot. And this was not congressional action that said you had to pull that thing down. Nope. It was actually a court. Obviously, we know what district that court is in. Right. But it's a court that said, yeah, you have to go in with a helicopter and dismantle the entire thing because you tried to support the base of this, right. uh, of this historic site right. that's up there. But the, the urgency for this is, as I understand it, is that that court order sad court order goes into effect this summer. Yes, that's my understanding too. There, this, that is, there is a timeliness of this issue and I know, I know you, uh, the gentleman, uh, heard, uh, heard all the details of this at the hearing that you had in your subcommittee. Thank you. And since I apologize for taking so much time yesterday, since I have so many more questions, I'll wait until I can talk to you in person. <laughs> this time I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Thank you very much. I needed the help uh, today. The gentleman from Massachusetts recognized. So, Mr. Politano, as far as your understanding is that the Senate is not going to would not take this bill up. Am I correct? Uh, that is correct. Right. So, I will, in, the, in lieu of that, I will associate myself with the remarks of the ranking member and my colleague, Mr. Hastings, and I will be with, happy. Will the gentleman to, yield? I'm happy to yield to the gentleman. I never suggested in my testimony that the Senate should take this bill up. I'd be delighted if they did. 
what I suggested very strongly is they pass a California water bill to resolve the issues. They can take this bill if they want over there and strip it and put whatever they can, they can pass over there. But until they do that, there will be no legislative fix. No, That's my point. Right. And, I, and I appreciate that, Mr. Hastings. But you know, today we were on the floor with a bill with, with a rule to consider a bill that's going nowhere. We have 1.6 million plus people who do not have unemployment insurance. We need to increase the minimum wage. We need an immigration bill. I mean, we need flood insurance passed. I mean, there are things that we need to do that I think that would that you know, this, and some of the stuff the Senate's already acted on. So all we need to do is act. So I just, I'm just getting to the point where at some point I'm wondering when we're going to do something that's going to really help somebody. Jim, you just make. I'm happy to yield to the gentleman. Uh, I'll just stand up and say it. The reason why we're here is because people, members of Congress from California, thought it was an important issue. Thank you very much. I have, and I, I have gentleman no yield? Yeah, I'm happy to yield. It is, it is critical for California because of the drought. Right. The problem is that we're not working together to do that the resolution of the water situation. Senator Feinstein, we are working with right. her for a bill. Right. And let me just be clear. I'm not trying to minimize the importance of this issue. What I am simply doing is kind of minimizing what we're doing here today because we're not solving this issue. Uh, and so with that, I would yield back my time. Chairman yields back his time. The gentleman from uh, Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, representing a uh, district that uh, during our nine-year drought in Georgia was uh, about 32 days away from uh, uh, leaving the entire metropolitan Atlanta area with no drinking water whatsoever, uh, I'm sympathetic. I appreciate the, the fire in, uh, in both of your eyes on that uh, issue. I can think of nothing uh, that is more important to the service of what we do for folks back home uh, someone said the other day, Rob, I, I just don't want to have to worry about government. I'm, 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 my goals for government are a, little, uh, uh, are a little ambiguous, but I don't want to have to worry uh, that things are going wrong. Folks are sitting back home in your uh, parts of the world are worrying uh, that uh, uh, tomorrow they're not going to be able to turn on the uh, spigot, worried that tomorrow their, their child's going to be thirsty and, and, uh, and water's not going to come out of the pipes. Uh, I, uh, I hope you do find uh, that pathway forward. And, Mr. Chairman, I even uh, if the Senate has said over uh, uh, under no set of circumstances will they take up this bill. You tried last year to encourage that. Uh, uh, Ms. Napolitano, you may have a, a, a better uh, uh, pathway forward to get folks over there to start acting, but if we can uh, if, if by, uh, by being here today and bringing this to the floor uh, tomorrow, we can take a step in the direction of sharing with our Senate colleagues that this is an issue that is of utmost importance to all of my California colleagues sitting on the front row, and that if they would be willing to be a partnership in that, we could find a collective pathway forward. I can think of no better way uh, to spend our, uh, our time. I'd be happy to yield. Thank you, sir. That's <clears throat> great in wisdom. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, and uh, yes, I've, uh, I, we've had a plan. We've tried to get a hearing on desalination. I can't get the bill heard. We have a plan to be able to have an increase in Title 16 to provide wet water, not paper water, not things that you can say you get 100 percent of water, but if you only have 50 percent, how are you going to deliver 100 percent? Issues that are critical to the people that you and I serve and the rest of us. And unfortunately, we play politics with it instead of sitting down and being able to formulate something that's going to be really helpful and provide a resolution. At the risks of, of, of pointing my finger at the folks on the other side, I mean, my hope is we're going to be able to make more uh, Democratic amendments in order on this one bill than uh, Republican amendments that the Senate has made in order for the entire second six months of, of 2013. So having that, having that, those diverse voices in the, in the debate, critically important. When I hear you talk, though, I, I, I hear the same thing in, in my state. You know, there, there's a long-term view. If we're talking about how to, how to protect our, our resources in Georgia over the long term, uh, we will be talking about desalinization. But if we're talking about how we're going to keep the spigots on next week, desalinization isn't going to help us to do that. So I have no doubt that, that both parts of that debate are, are, are critical, and I, uh, I can't imagine a, uh, a, a pathway forward, not for the next quarter, uh, but for the next quarter century, uh, that doesn't uh, include that, uh, that entire conversation. I would not expect the chairman to, uh, to disagree uh, with that. My sense reading this language is that this is very much a short-term solution, uh, uh, not to a to a century-long crisis, but to a crisis that is of, 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 of meaningful proportions tomorrow or the next day or a week from tomorrow? Well, y yes and no. Uh, the, uh, the members of California offered a very short-term solution to try to immediately address this, and that was, that was uh, 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 rejected you know, right out. So that's the reason we're back here with this. Well, this does have short-term provisions, as I had mentioned. It does have really more long-term solutions 
uh, than short term. But the short term re resolution was rejected right out of hand, so that's why we're here with this. It is uh, uh, heartbreaking is such a, is such a, uh, a cavalier word, but we talk so much in this committee about how we're going to care about people, how we're going to yeah. deal with issues that are important to families back home. I look at my California colleagues uh, there on the front row, and I, 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 listen, I listen to folks talking about double-digit unemployment rates because there, there's no order in the field. I listen to folks talking about being worried about their kids and their, and their schools. Again, if, if uh, uh, I, would, I would challenge any of my colleagues, if there is a more important issue uh, to, uh, to the families back home in your districts than this one, uh, I wish we could take uh, that up uh, as well, but I know this is the, is the top uh, priority on those minds, and I'm, I'm grateful to you all for, for moving Thank forward you. and having a spirit of, of uh, we will be able to find a solution as opposed to uh, uh, this is a, a futile process uh, going nowhere. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. If I may, I have to be on the floor. I have to be on the floor for an amendment. If I could if you, you, or designate Mr. McClintock, who's the chairman of the subcommittee of the water, on my committee to take my place, I appreciate it. If the gentleman stand by, is there objection to the request? I, I have no objection, but I have one quick question that I would okay. like to ask. And just, uh, just and, and we'll go just to you. One just question. one second. Is there any objection? No then objection. The gentleman, if he will answer one question from the gentleman, then we right. would ask Mr. Nunes if he would did, come. Did you speak with Senator Feinstein regarding this measure or any other measure? I, I, ha I personally have not spoken, but I understand my, uh, my colleagues from California have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I would ask the gentleman, uh, Mr. McClintock, the uh, subcommittee chairman, uh, if he would come and uh, take the chairman's place. Uh, chairman Hastings, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time to do that. Uh, by the way, uh, we are going to continue the questioning. I will come back to you on another panel, but you are here to take the place of the chairman to answer questions for the committee. The gentleman, did you answer, ask all the questions that you No, asked? I did not. I just Je wanted Je to ask him Je one question. Je Je well, the gentleman's recognized for Thank you, then, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Um, I began, perhaps, with a moment of levity uh, extracted from one of the, the country's great comedians that's uh, closing out his final week as uh, the Tonight Show host. But last night, Jay Leno commented uh, that NASA, uh, which I uh, very much support, and I'm sure most of us uh, here do, is planning to... Uh, send space vehicles um, uh, to have water on the moon. And Jay Leno said, why don't they send those vehicles here to California instead of <laughs> to, to the moon? Uh, and I thought that that was at least uh, a, a bit of a relief for uh, the seriousness of uh, this issue. Clearly, not only uh, in California, uh, but throughout the world, uh, way beyond my lifetime, uh, there will be as many wars about water as there will be uh, or are ongoing about fossil fuel. Um, I've had the good fortune of experiencing world travel. And when I'm in areas uh, like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, and you see the critical issues that they're confronted with, or when I'm in Africa and they're experiencing uh, drought and you see children starve, as I did, uh, then you begin to understand that this is a bigger problem than just if the sparrow falls, it's going to fall in Miramar, Florida, where I live. Um, uh, indeed, California has a critical problem. Um, and I don't know that Mr. McClintock is in a position to substitute for the question that I would have put to the chairman, so I'll just ask it rhetorically. And that is uh, that um, uh, Chairman Hastings commented that um, you need to do something now. Uh, I, I, I think he ignores uh, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan uh, that has been ongoing as a collaborative effort. And uh, toward that end, it would seem to me uh, a great deal more sensible uh, uh, to move in that direction. And I also would challenge Chairman Hastings to think uh, by any stretch of the imagination that he has or the California delegation uh, writ large or split has any greater concern about this issue than Governor Brown. Uh, that would be 
um, uh, pointedly ridiculous because um, clearly um, he has the exacting responsibility uh, with reference to this matter. But what's going on here is rank politics. And that's regrettable uh, because the honest to goodness truth is uh, that uh, as humans and as caring uh, uh, people, we need to begin to address this problem, whether it's in California or any place. My good friend from Georgia and his and my state and Alabama have ongoing uh, uh, fights uh, with reference to um, uh, uh, water, and many of them are in litigation. First time I went to Puerto Rico uh, and Virgin Islands uh, with my mother, we saw transports of water. We talk about our delegates uh, from Puerto Rico um, uh, to the uh, uh, Virgin Islands, and uh, that found that uh, particularly interesting. Uh, all over the world, um, this is a growing problem. Um, I, I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to include in um, uh, the record um, three uh, Four uh, letters, uh, one from the Sierra Club, attesting to uh, their membership of more than two million. The other um, uh, from the American Sports Fishing Association, and the other, uh, without uh, going into great detail, it's uh, Ms. Napolitano uh, spoke about some of them. Uh, but it is a wide-ranging group of um, 17 organizations um, and uh, their opposition um, uh, to uh, this particular matter. So I uh, ask Without objection, uh, be unanimous the consent uh, 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 for these. Mr. McClintock, what is the constitutional authority for Congress Preempting, and I don't know whether you were here when I put the question to uh, Chairman Hastings, uh, trying uh, my best to correct him regarding uh, preemption, because as I read this law, it seems um, uh, that this bill um, is not about interstate commerce or navigable waters. It's about water rights within the state, and especially um, uh, since... Uh, it has been repeatedly affirmed that uh, federal reclamation law uh, uh, does not preempt California law. And yesterday we were here talking at, at length about uh, uh, these matters, and I disagree with the chairman, and I wonder what your position is, Mr. Clintock, then, and you know, uh, point me to the authority for Congress um, uh, to um, preempt what is being done in California with reference to state law. I'd be happy to. You're referring to the Reclamation Act of 1902, yeah. Section 8. In California versus the United States in 1978, the United States Supreme Court interpreted that section uh, that's invoked by the opponents of this bill um, to mean that a clear congressional directive, their words, would invoke federal supremacy over any conflicting state law governing operations of, of a federal reclamation project. This measure does precisely that. It doesn't preempt state water rights. It specifically invokes and protects state water rights against infringement by any government bureaucracy, local, state, or federal, which is a legitimate constitutional function of the federal government that was established under the 14th Amendment and made essential by the terms of the California state-approved joint operating agreement of these intertwined water systems. Uh, federal supremacy over this issue was further established at the request of the state of California when the Central Valley Project was first envisioned. Mm -hmm. I, I, I find your uh, uh, response uh, interesting um, because it, it seems um, uh, that my colleagues here in this institution handpick the times that they want to use states' rights and then blast them on other occasions. Uh, I, I accept uh, uh, fully uh, uh, your response, but I do not believe uh, that it gets to the point of what is happening here, and that is preempting um, uh, what is, in my uh, view, California's prerogative. Mr. Chairman, I uh, am going to take the time because 
I feel it necessary to put this in perspective through the voice of those who I believe know best to not take away any of the concerns uh, that my colleagues uh, from California, both Republican and Democrat, uh, have. Uh, but uh, Ms. Slaughter alluded to a portion of, of the Secretary of Natural Resources of California's letter. Uh, but it's uh, enlightening in several of its particulars uh, uh, requesting opposition to this measure. He says, Dear Chairman Hastings, Ranking Member DeFazio, and members of the committee, California is experiencing the worst water crisis in our modern history. We are in our third consecutive year of below normal precipitation, and this year's snowpack, on which 25 million Californians depend as the source of their water supply, currently is only 10% of what it should be. In Sacramento and Redding, we've broken all records for consecutive dry days in the middle of the rainy season. The California Department of Public Health reports that 17 communities across the state are at risk of running out of drinking water within 60 to 120 days. Just days ago, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife announced the closure of several fisheries and Cal Fire has already responded to over 400 fires in the month of January, a startling fact when you consider they responded to zero during the same time last year. As you know, California's climate is such that it is generally dry for almost half the year, and we rely on rain and snow during the winter season to carry us through the year. Conditions in terms of both water supply and water quality are unprecedented and serious. Simply put, we face the driest year on record after two dry years, which is why Governor Brown proclaimed a drought state of emergency on January 17th of 2014. California is a huge state in which its 38 million residents depend on a large and unique series of dams, canals, and waterways administered by hundreds of different water agencies. It is a complex system and legislation that alters it in favor of some interest over others in a different part of the state in the middle of this great water emergency when water managers have tried to plan and act on current realities is not helpful. And he writes to express their uh, strong opposition. And what he says is what I believe to be true. The bill falsely holds the promise of water relief that cannot be delivered because in this drought, the water simply does not exist. And that's where Ms. Slaughter uh, uh, pointed to it. And I ask unanimous consent that this letter be made a part of the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, be included. In the Finally, record. I recognize that many of my colleagues uh, 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 do not have respect for uh, the views of uh, editorial boards. Um, uh, most of us, uh, quarrel with our local media because they quarrel with us. Um, and I'm sure that uh, some perceive uh, the Los Angeles Times um, as a, a, a more uh, center-left or left-leaning organization. But the clarity that they speak in their February uh, 3rd editorial is deserving of attention in this room. Um, as California's drought, quoting from it, uh, the editorial being playing politics with California's drought. Competing interests are working together on water. A House GOP bill would undermine their efforts. As California's drought continues, the article goes on to say, and more than a dozen rural communities, editorial that is, not article, ponder what to do when the drinking water runs out sometimes in March. It would be nice if the state's Republican politicians brought some straightforward plans for relief to the table. But what many of them are bringing instead is a tired political tactic, barely and laughably distinguished as a remedy for the lack of rainfall. The quote, man-made California drought, unquote, is the term House Republicans use to describe the state's current dry condition as if it were somehow the hand of humankind, environmentalists, or even worse, Democrats, that has stopped the snowfall over the Sierra 
and kept the dams that store water for fields, orchards, and homes from being replenished. Funny, isn't it, that folks who question man's ability to affect the global climate are so quick to assign human causes to the drought. Most recently, uh, the term man-made drought, quote unquote, has been used by representatives Kevin McCarthy, uh, uh, from Bakersfield, Representative David, uh, David Nunes from Tulare, uh, and David Valadio from Hanford, in conjunction with House Bill 3946, a retread of earlier bills that sought to upend years of negotiations and reams of carefully crafted law and policy to protect water rights and balance the needs of the state's many interests and communities. Of course, they aren't talking about the real drought. If they were, they'd acknowledge that it is actually created by a stubborn high-pressure zone off the Pacific coast that meteorologists have taken to call in the ridiculously resilient ridge. That mountain of dense air has blocked uh, the winter storms that typically move down from the Gulf of Alaska and east into California, and the blockage that has kept rain from falling in the southern part of uh, the state, and more important, snow from falling on the Sierra, we can only guess how many more months or years might pass before it dissipates. What they really mean when they refer to the, quote, drought, unquote, are the cuts in water allocations to agricultural interests in the Central Valley, not just in dry years, but potentially even in wet ones, as the state works out a plan to distribute water wisely among interests who need or at least want um, or more than will ever be available. The proposed House bill would not provide any relief from the real drought, but would instead permanently reallocate water for one interest in their imagined people versus fish scenario. Towns are going dry and growers are going out of business because crazy environmentalists are hogging water to protect an obscure fish, the Delta smelt. I had the good fortune with my father going out on the Pacific during a grunion run and getting pretty uh, tipsy trying to catch them little things. Uh, but. Water that would irrigate fields and keep people working is instead being kept in the San Sacramento, San Joaquin, River Delta, and flushed into the ocean. What they don't like to point out is that without that supposed flush pushing out into the Pacific, seawater would continue to intrude farther into the Delta, leaving only useless salty brine to pump into canals and onto fields and then where would the growers and the rest of us be? Footnote there, Dr. Fox earlier commented that no one is more concerned about water than she. I guess then my 77 years on earth allows that uh, in my professional career, uh, the first meeting that I attended was uh, of the South Florida Water Management uh, area. And when I first ran for office, I pointed to the fact uh, that development in South Florida was leading into intrusion into the aquifers, which was being breached by salt water. There's so much similarity to all of these things, and all of us ought to uh, pay attention. Without restoring the dry stretch of the San Joaquin River, there can be no recharging of Central Valley Town's grand water supplies and no hope that the river will rescue orchards and cities with uh, southern Sierra snowmelt in the event global climate change forever reduces levels of snowfall in the mountains to the north. And as for the smell, the Endangered Species Act protects not only that fish, but all of us by holding together the fragile environmental web we rely on. Agriculture is an essential California industry with benefits that are felt far beyond the region where crops grow. California's economy depends on it, but three out of every four raindrops Three out of every four snowflakes that fall on California and are diverted for human use go to agriculture. It is part of a network of water users that must conserve more and do a better job of planning for the future. California has a plan, 
the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, which I asked the chairman about, that has brought together representatives of the competing interests who recognize that they must work together to sustain one another with limited supplies of water. The Republican bill would undermine, uh, undermine that effort by demonstrating that any agreement can be broken at any time by legislation. The state's water users, all of us, need laws that support, not subvert, efforts to balance our water use. And that ridiculously resilient ridge, um, my belief is uh, that that adjective could apply uh, to uh, this bill as being just as ridiculously uh, resilient because it keeps coming up over and over again to go nowhere. And why we are not addressing issues that are critical to this nation generally and bringing up measures that we know that are not going to pass the United States Senate and no effort is being made to talk with them. That's why I asked Chairman Hastings, had he spoken with Diane Feinstein? I pick up the phone, I call senators, I talk with three of them today, one from my state, one from New Jersey, and one from California. So I can pick up the phone and call them and I don't understand why the hell other people can't do that and that we can't get on about the business of trying to correct these issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back his time. Does the uh, gentleman from Oklahoma seek recognition? The gentleman does not. The gentleman from Florida. The gentleman from Florida does not seek recognition. The gentleman from Orlando, Florida. Well, the I, just, recognized. I, I got here a little bit late, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would like to ask Mr. McClintock, are you as bad as what's been portrayed there? The, it, it, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting to note that we are in the third year of drought, and despite the fact that we are in the third year of drought, we have still diverted 1.6 million acre feet of water desperately needed of, uh, for storage of, uh, for the amusement of the Delta smelt. That, that's water that could have been used to reverse the situation that Californians face. We in Sacramento watched the Sacramento River at full flood as that uh, water was released into the Pacific Ocean when it was desperately needed to be retained behind our dams that are now virtually empty. Um, it's true that we cannot create rain. But we can take measures to increase storage and reinforce existing water rights and increase capacity and assure that we never have to face a crisis of this magnitude again. The provisions in this bill allow for the expansion of Lake McClure by 70,000 acre feet. It gives local water agencies the ability to store additional surplus water in the new Malonis. It sets a deadline for the secretary to come up with a plan to increase storage by 800,000 acre feet to fulfill the promise that was made and broken in the Central Valley Project Improvement Act. Uh, it authorizes the Bureau to part with locals to advance water storage pr projects, in including enhancement of the Shasta Dam in, in Shasta County, the Los Boqueros uh, Reservoir in Contra Costa. It uh, encourages the partnering on planning and feasibility uh, studies for Sites Reservoir in Calusa County, the upper San Joaquin River storage. The, here's the bottom line. Everybody thinks that the Colorado River is the mother load of all water in the western United States. It is a junior sister to the Sacramento. The Sacramento has 20% greater water flow. The difference is this. We store 70 million acre feet of water on the Colorado and only 10 million acre feet on the Sacramento. We desperately need to increase storage and until we have increased storage, we desperately need not to waste that water by dumping it into the Pacific Ocean. You know, with respect to salinity in the Delta, this measure guarantees 800,000 acre feet of water to preserve the Delta habitat and hold back salt water. Above this amount, it's not necessary to maintain the fresh water barrier, uh, and it is simply dumping the ocean, uh, the, the water uh, into the ocean. And I would reiterate that in a, in a time of severe shortage, that's the last thing we ought to be doing with that water. We ought to be assuring that it is uh, conserved in, uh, in storage uh, and released for the benefit of um, the uh, human population of California, uh, which if you look at the uh, population counts is probably one of the more endangered species uh, within that border, the borders of that state. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. It's time, gentlewoman chair. Okay. 
does not seek recognition. I want to thank uh, this panel for being here with the recognition that the gentleman, Mr. McClintock, represented uh, Mr. Hastings, and I would uh, uh, ask the gentleman, I had put you down for the third panel, not the second, not the first panel, so I'll ask the gentleman if he has time to stick around. Oh, absolutely. I want to thank both of you for being here. This panel is now excused. Thank you very much. I'd like to, if I can, uh, call on Mr. Stewart, who's been here waiting. I know Mr. Stewart has to go to the floor to sit in the chair. I'd like to ask Mr. Stewart to come up. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Nunes if he would join him, please. Uh, without objection, anything you have entered the record will be done so. Gentlemen from Utah is recognized. Well, excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, it's my understanding you want to talk, speak about the land bill uh, in this in this. Uh, description so just so the members are aware of that we're dealing with two bills gentlemen's recognized thank you mr chairman i'll be brief i think uh for the thing i'd like to discuss i think is practical and not as controversial as perhaps you've been discussing here to date uh the park act uh is uh my intention to craft something that is practical and nonpartisan, and that would address a matter of great importance to many of us who represent uh, national parks or have those type of uh, great institutions in our districts Recognizing that we can't always guarantee the government operations will continue uninterrupted, I wanted to create a platform where we could bring some certainty uh, to those who are often the most affected. Uh, we, I think, recognize that national parks are kind of a political pressure point. When our national parks shut down, Americans notice that. Uh, by their nature and, of course, by their location, they are often, in fact, almost always in rural and sometimes very isolated parts of the country. And citizens in these rural areas are often the very most vulnerable. I believe the Park Act is a practical alternative to leaving these citizens, and whether they're Democrats or Republicans or Independents, but to leaving them less exposed. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, let me just say, uh, last fall, uh, Utah and various other states, Arizona, Montana, for example, some that were affected by the partial shutdown developed a quick solution based on the needs of their communities. Uh, these states approached the Department of Interior and they offered to fund the operation of the parks out of their own budgets until the government had reopened. I think this is a great example of an innovative solution that is often found within our states or within local communities. On October 24th, I introduced H.R. 3311, the Provide Access and Retain Continuity or the Park Act. This legislation would require the Secretary of Interior during interruptions in government operations to enter into a memorandum of understanding with willing states to allow for continued operation of certain federal facilities. The agreement would also require that the federal government would reimburse the states for the costs incurred for them during the time of a shutdown. It offers communities and businesses like those in my district much more certainty, and the states would be allowed to step in and fill the gap that Congress is unable to do at a time of, uh, of funding uncertainty. I'm pleased today to offer the Park Act as amendment to H.R. 2954 uh, Public Lands and Improvement Act. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back my time. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman is seeking um, uh, us to be quick in our work, and so I'd like to ask if there's anybody on the Republican side that has a question for Mr. Stewart. The gentleman's recognized. Sorry. Um, so what I'm, what I'm hearing is that what you're talking about is an effort to try and come up with a plan going forward to alleviate problems we've seen in not just this shutdown but the original shutdown. Yes. And part of the pros problem was that the federal government said they didn't have a mechanism in hand to accept efforts from the state and they don't have a mechanism in hand to actually give back what they took from the state even though they took it. So I see three areas that we could be looking at here. What you're trying to come up with is a mechanism that would not even deal with situations when government is in, is in peril, but if there is even a lapse of funding, this could be a mechanism that should be there that would provide continuity and give a revenue source that would solve it. Yes. We could even expand this, as I understand, as I was just thinking here, to look to the future of coming up with programs in which states could actually partner with the federal government for these programs, and that could all be encompassed in this thing. I, I also understand the states took, the states paid the Park Service several hundred thousand dollars. Park Service was magnanimous enough to take the money, even though they didn't have a bureaucratic mechanism to do it. But now the uh, Park Service says they don't have a bureaucratic mechanism to give back the money, even though they have been totally reimbursed. 
So we have several hundred thousand dollars floating around in their budgets. There is no accountability to that. Your bill does not address that money that morally ought to be given back. Yeah. You're just looking at the future. It does both, Mr. Bishop. It was okay. does provide a mechanism where the money could be reimbursed back to the states as well. And as you illustrated there, uh, there's inconsistency with their willingness to take the money and then their unwillingness to pay that back once they've been refunded for those operations. Yeah. Thank you. And our, again, our whole point is just to provide certainty to individuals who are very dependent on these parks and, in addition, those who are uh, hoping to enjoy them. If you're from Maine or California or uh, Europe and you're planning a vacation and you understand the government may enter one of these times, you know, many of those people are canceling their, their travel plans and it affects in a very negative way these very rural and very vulnerable dist uh, parts of my district. Thank you. I'm done. Gentleman yells back his time. Uh, further questions from any uh, those on the Republican side? Any questions for any uh, from the Democrats? Seeing none. Mr. Stewart, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, on behalf of myself and the committee, I want to thank you for your service to the United States Air Force, uh, service to this great nation. We applaud you and appreciate your service on behalf of the United States. You're very kind, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I think I should get brownie points for being brief. <laughs> I'll, t I'll tell you how, how many brownie points you get. You're excused. We, we should get brownie points for being brief, too. Uh, when you deserve them. When you deserve them. Thank you very much. Appreciate it's it, Mr. There, there, is, there is a little bit of balancing. I, I know I've uh, asked the gentleman, uh, Mr. News, to come up. I'd also like to ask Mr. Garamendi if he'd like to come, as well as the gentleman, Mr. Huffman, if he would uh, join uh, this uh, panel, and we're going to keep going here. Gentlemen, welcome to the Rules Committee. As always, and I know each of you have been to the Rules Committee before. Without objection, anything you have in writing will be entered to the record. Uh, brevity is a, a precious commodity around here. The gentleman from California, Mr. News, is recognized. G gentlemen's welcome. Delighted you're here, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, and I will be brief uh, just to uh, answer any of the committee's questions, but I will respond to the L.A. Times uh, editorial that uh, Mr. Hastings uh, read, and, and I would just respond by saying this, that those that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So it, Los Angeles gets their water, as Mr. Bishop said, from the Colorado River. Uh, they also get it from uh, Sacramento, San Joaquin uh, Delta. So if they want to give up their water, then someone from those regions should offer an amendment. We'd we'll accept it, put it into this bill. We can strip their water rights, too. But that's what happened from by the Endangered Species Act and with the laws that were passed in 1992 uh, and then again in 07, they took our private property. So we're not asking for anything but our property back. And we have farmers and farm workers that are out of work. So this was entirely predictable. It happened before. Now it's worse this time. That's why if the Senate would have worked with us when we passed a bill a year and a half ago, we would not be in this predicament. But now we are in an all-out emergency. So I thank you for your support of uh, my legislation. I hope that you will pass this as quickly as possible and I yield back. Mr. News, thank you very much. Mr. Garamendi, you're recognized. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A lot has been said. I'll try not to uh, repeat most of it. Uh, this bill, in its current form, does overturn California law, also pushes aside the California Constitution, and basically upsets virtually every water contract in the state of California. Uh, and court uh, cases that have been settled uh, over long, long-running disputes. Uh, it is not the way to solve the current crisis and certainly not to solve the long-term crisis because it does take water from somebody and gives it to somebody else. Uh, there is a solution. I have an amendment that uh, is before the committee that uh, I think all of us would agree to. And that amendment can provide some immediate relief. I would like to point out that the Congress, both the Senate and the House, and the omnibus bill did reauthorize um, the Federal Drought Emergency Program, which is now in place, does provide a platform for relief to many of the agencies, uh, but not all, uh, that are having these kinds of uh, drought problems. So we have actually acted. But we're going to need to fund that. And that's an appropriation issue and it's going to become, uh, come before the Congress. The amendment that I have uh, basically modifies this bill by taking out those parts that are so contentious that we've heard so much about in this hearing and moves to three areas for which there is general agreement in California. And I'm sure that my colleagues to the uh, 
left of me and uh, to the right, would agree that we need to conserve. There is water conservation uh, programs that exist today, Title 16 of the Central Valley Improvement Act, which, by the way, is repealed uh, by the current uh, proposal before us, has a uh, water smart and recycling program in it. Uh, this bill, uh, my amendment, would promote that effort. Also, uh, beyond conservation, we have recycling. Uh, Ms. Uh, Representative Napolitano was here, a strong advocate for recycling. That program would also be repealed by this bill. It is in the Central Valley Improvement Act. It should not be repealed. It should be augmented because recycling is part of the solution. In fact, the fifth biggest river on the west coast of the Western Hemisphere are the sanitation plants in Southern California. So we should be recycling that water. It's readily available. It is a midterm. It is not an immediate solution. Uh, the third is, con is uh, storage. My amendment would augment and provide for the storage. Some of it readily available today, again, through the Central Valley Improvement Act, Title 16, which does have uh, for all of the West, not just for California, uh, would, allow for re um, would allow a program to continue to operate to recharge the aquifers and immediate st uh, storage there, as well as surface storage which was uh, discussed by one of the uh, advocates of the bill a few moments ago, Mr. McClintock. So the amendment that I'm proposing would do those three things and would not get into the various contentious parts of the current legislation, but would set those aside, would allow us to move forward on three areas in which there is near unanimous agreement that we should do those three things, some of which would provide immediate relief. And I would call the attention to all the members here that we do have a law in place the Federal Drought Emergency Program in the omnibus bill in place today, it's going to need money for all of the West, not just for California. That's a separate uh, subject, not before this committee at this moment, but will be before in the House and the Congress. So I would ask that my amendment be made in order, that we'd have a chance to uh, put it on the floor. Mr. Chairman, indeed, thank you very much. Appreciate you taking time to be with us today okay. with a, uh, a message that the, the committee does need to consider. Mr. Hoffman, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Garamendi, yes. I'm going to ask that you Questions? please. Yes, sir. Uh, if you're going to come talk, you get to uh, get the other side. Yes, sir. And I do recognize, and that was a genuine offer, uh, but I'd ask that you stay in. And uh, we will get Mr. Peters up here, Mr. Valadeo, soon. Mr. Hoffman, welcome. Thank I'm you, glad Mr. that you're here, and the gentleman's recognized. Appreciate you, including yes, me. Um, I have two amendments that I'd like to discuss with you. and. Uh, let me first, if I could, Mr. Chair, say that the last time California had a severe multi-year drought, something very different and very historic happened. Uh, Democrats and Republicans came together in the state capitol. I happened to be the chair of the Water Committee in the state legislature at that time. Uh, Senator Feinstein uh, was involved and played a facilitating role. And for the first time in decades, a bipartisan supermajority of the California legislature came together to pass sweeping water reforms to solve the problems of the Bay Delta and also to promote greater water supply reliability statewide. Uh, these, water reform, uh, th these water reform breakthroughs of 2009 received national media attention. Uh, they were supported by people throughout the state. The New York Times called them the most significant water reforms since the state water project was put in place in the 1960s. And I bring this all up because the first amendment I would like to offer, Mr. Chair, is to clarify that even though we may not be at a point of bipartisan problem solving here in this Congress like the California legislature was a few years ago, uh, let's at least make sure we're not preempting through this sweeping preemption language in this bill the best thing to happen in California water uh, in half a century. So my first amendment would simply clarify that the historic California, bipartisan California water reforms uh, of 2009 are not preempted. Uh, the second amendment I would like to uh, submit uh, would clarify that the, the, again, very broad preemption language in this bill likewise does not preempt uh, Native American water and fishing rights. Uh, I don't know if it was the intention or not, but uh, there are numerous provisions that are uh, written so broadly that they could easily preempt uh, the use of water and certainly the right to fish and the enjoyment of that water, and that could affect lots of tribes throughout the state. So my second amendment would, uh, would offer that clarification as well. Thank you very much. Uh
appreciate all three of you being here. Uh, Mr. Nunes, I have quite some time uh, heard about the plight of not only the valley, but I've seen it firsthand. And it is amazing how the struggle has continued. Uh, there was a, there are a lot of people that are suggesting you should wait, wait for Mrs. Senator Feinstein to bring a bill forth. And in my way of thinking, the people who are closest to the problem ought to have a say in it too. And I, my own personal opinion is that's what you did a year ago and that's what you're doing now. So despite what we've heard here today, I'm delighted that you have brought this bill, which is an idea of the people who are closest to that. And I, I'm delighted that we're doing this hearing today. Mrs. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. McGovern. Mr. Chairman, I have no questions other than I hope that uh, those who have amendments will be have the opportunity to be able to have them offered. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Polis, do you have any questions for this? Uh, you, you do not. Uh, anybody else have questions? A uh, gentleman is recognized, Chairman. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Peters, I'm very interested in your amendment, and I appreciate you trying to make sure native water rights are protected. It's uh, something that doesn't get a lot of thought around here. We're embroiled in quite a bit of disputes in our, my own state right now, tribal and state government. But I'm curious, if you had, uh, have, have tribes specifically objected? I'm going to give you a chance to, Mr. Nunes, to discuss this, because your record on Native Americans is as good as anybody in this Congress, quite frankly, both of you. And so I'm just curious, have, there, have, have tribes brought this to your attention? Has there been some concern, or are you just acting preemptively with the best of intentions? I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just curious if, if we've got on record the tribal concerns. Yeah. Um, th thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. Yes, this is a very real and timely concern uh, of tribes, including tribes in my district. To give you one of several examples, uh, the Hoopa Valley Tribe uh, has its water rights on the Trinity River, uh, longstanding water and fishing uh, rights going back before uh, the state of California. And um, that Trinity River diversion is part of the Central Valley Project. So when a law like this is put forward, preempting the state of California from playing its customary role of protecting water users in the state, including public trust and recreational and other values that would be of great importance to the Hoopa Valley tribe, um, I think a clarification like this is very much in order. And yes, they have expressed concern. The Karuk tribe uh, is another one uh, that is in a similar position on the, uh, uh, on the same issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nunes? Thank you, uh, Mr. Cole. Th this whole uh, issue of state preemption is just a, just a, a false uh, red herring uh, put up by the left uh, because they know what they've done to our region uh, is wrong. They've taken people's private property. Uh, and so they put up the state preemption argument, which is total nonsense. They all know it uh, because the federal government controls most of the water in the state. And it's pr every time you change federal law, the way that the water was taken away from us was by preempting state law. So every time you move water in California, you preempt, by, you preempt state law. So uh, for example, probably the best example, and I would actually go along with all this preemption stuff if, if San Francisco and San Jose and all the Bay Area, if they were willing to give up their water and ship it out to the Delta to protect the fish that they so love, they claim to love, I'd have some respect for them but I don't think a lot of people in this country understand that part of Yosemite was dammed up by this Congress, federal preemption. That's water that should go to my area, and they conveniently pipe that water and use it all over the Bay Area, which is a desert drier than ours. So you want to talk about people who, who live in a glass house? There's another one. I don't see anybody. They want, they want to protect the fish. They want to protect the salt in the Delta. Great. Send your water out there. We'll pump it up from the Delta over there, too. But they'd have to live under the same regulations. So uh, you know what this is about? This is about talking about Tenth Amendment states' rights uh, as a red herring to try to scare Republicans, because they know we have the votes to pass this. And they know the Senate doesn't want to take it up. Why? Because they don't want to be exposed that they get their water from the same place that we do, except they have preempted state law for 100 years. A couple of Quick points. First, I owe you an apology, Mr. Huffman. I, I uh, misreferred to you, and my good friend brought that to my attention. I apologize. Uh, well, I'm called <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and uh, look, I have enormous respect for my, my friend, uh, Mr. Nunes. Well, you're all my friends, but particularly uh, Mr. Nunes and Mr. Garamondi. I know better clearly than I know you, Mr. Huffman, but I look forward to making uh, friends with you uh, in the future. Um, and it is unusual, I must say. I've, I've, my experience has been states are usually big transgressors on Indian water rights, not the big defenders. Uh, and it's been more often the federal government has been, uh, as bad as its record is, more likely to, to defend tribal water rights. But anyway, that, uh, that answered my question, my concern. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. And uh, you'll, did might, you? might I, through the chair, just offer a quick clarification? Does the gentleman wish to engage? On your name or? Uh, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mr. Cole holds time, gentlemen. I certainly uh, yield. Uh, there's an important clarification of California water law. The Constitution of the state of California provides that all water in the state belongs to the people of California. It is not private property. That public resource is then allocated and administered through the state, through the State Water Resources Control Board. That entire mechanism for managing a public resource is what would be preempted and taken away, including the public trust doctrine, which not only goes back to the founding of California, but goes back to Justinian law in Roman code. So I, I think those are important clarifications when we talk about the reach and the scope and the disruption caused by the preemptive language in this bill. Gentlemen. Uh, yeah, just to respond, so the water that the federal government preempted take, took from my area and shipped it over, pipes it over to San Francisco, it's a pure preemption. That was so, a, a permit granted by the state of California to the city of San Francisco. And signed into law by the federal government. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentlemen, yields back time. Uh, further questions from any representative? Gentlemen, Dr. Burgess is recognized. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Nunez, we've talked about this before. Uh, in fact, I think we passed, or the House passed legislation, considered legislation in 2009 or 2010 on this. What is the problem for getting this solved? I mean, there have been some high profile television shows public town halls down in your district, uh, talking to the people who've been affected. Is it, is it the House? Is it the Senate? What, what is, is it the Endangered Species Act? What is preventing you from solving your problem? Thank you, uh, Mr. Burgess. So basically, obviously the House of Representatives knows the right thing to do. The Senate has refused to engage. Uh, it took uh, Speaker Boehner coming out to then, who then had to, the, the Senate had to respond to the Speaker of the House. Uh, before that, they refused to respond, uh, largely because in order to get elected in the state of California, and I like my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, but you don't make it through a Democratic primary without the endorsement of NRDC, Sierra Club, and all the environmental groups. So the same goes for the statewide candidates. So the governor, the, the senators in our state, they don't want to upset NRDC. They don't want to upset Sierra Club. And I understand why. People have made millions. The lawyers for NRDC have made millions off of this water. They're rich. They've sued. They've taken people's property rights away. I get it. But at the end of the day, my constituents lost their private property rights in this while others got rich and others get water for free. And some of the most compelling stories I've ever seen have been from folks who have been personally damaged and, and ravaged by the policy. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I look forward to us fixing this. And I hope we can Mr. help the gentleman. Burgess, uh, Mr. Garamendi wanted to respond. Oh, as well. beg your pardon. I can't see anything. I sit over here on the end. I, I depend on Mr. McGovern to give me guidance. Uh, <laughs> it, California water has been fought over for a long, long time, and there's been a lot of confusion, particularly during this hearing, about exactly what is at stake here. Um, we're in the midst of a very, very severe drought. That's the underlying problem here. There are solutions to this issue, but we're now caught up in a major water fight in California of which this particular bill is one of the uh, battles going on. Unfortunately, it does not solve anything. There are, within the California water scheme, there is multiple districts, two major ones, the state of California operating its California water plant project and the federal government with the Central Valley project. The Central Valley project has customers up and down the Central Valley. The state has customers in the Central Valley and in Southern California. This particular issue today revolves around the San Luis unit of the Central Valley project. 
the San Luis unit of the Central Valley Project was the last unit to become part of the Central Valley Project and has the junior water rights. Those rights, as Mr. Huffman said, were allocated to the Central Valley, to the federal government, through the Central Valley Project, to the San Luis unit of yeah, the Central Valley Mr. Project. Mr. Garmendi, the result of all time, that, if I, I, I might, appreciate the lecture, but honestly, what are you doing to solve Mr. Nunez's well, problem? I'm that is the bottom that, line. That's what we're here about today. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I'm going to yield back in the interest of time. I know the Democrats have a meeting. Gentleman yields back his time. Does gentleman seek time? Yeah, I'd like gentleman's right. I, I just again, common courtesy. If Mr. Garamendi wants to finish his statement, I think yeah. I'd like to be able to yield him. The time. Gentleman so, seeks time. Gentleman's recognized. Unfortunately, we all too often make policy based upon a high level of ignorance, and we ought not do that. So, Mr. Burgess, if you care, I'll continue my explanation. The San Luis unit has the junior water rights, sometimes called the shortest straw. It, is, it has the interruptible supply. When there is a drought, when there is a shortage of water, the San Luis unit, specifically the Westlands Water District, has the shortest supply, and it is the one that is interrupted. It's not taking private property rights. It is a right that's granted under a contract with the federal government and the state of California allocating the water. It is in the contract itself between the federal government, the state of California, and the district, that in a drought it gets the short supply. And in this case, it may get no water at all. It is in their contract and has been in their contract since the inception of that contract some 50 years ago. Ever since that contract was put in place, this water district, the largest in the nation, has tried to get a higher priority. This bill would do that to the detriment of every other water user in the state of California. That's the problem here with this bill. There is a solution to the California water crisis. It's going to take a different approach. It's going to take what we've talked about. We're going to have to have conservation. We're going to have to have recycling, desalinization. We're going to have to have more storage. We've got to deal with the Delta and the problems of the Delta. And we've got to recognize that all of California has an interest in a long-term, complicated, but possible solution. This bill, unfortunately, overrides California law, contracts, <clears throat> and constitution, and creates a huge war without solving the problem. Thank you for the time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back his time. Does gentleman from Colorado seek uh, any time? Hmm? Does not seek time. I want to thank uh, all the members of the committee. Uh, I would remind us that I know we're dealing with very difficult issues and that I recognize that there are members of the delegation that may not agree with each other. I want to compliment each of us for uh, our words that we've chosen and the way that we have conducted ourselves. And I want to thank this panel very much. You're now excused. Thank you. I'm now going to call up uh, the next panel, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Costa, the gentleman, Mr. Peters, uh, the gentleman, Mr. McClintock, and I do not see Dr. Barry. So, oh, I no, I do not see Dr. Barry, and the gentleman, Mr. Valadeo. Uh, if you for if if I could ask you, David, well, I'm going to put you right over here. We, whenever we get in trouble, we get a new stenographer, <laughs> and that's the chair that is reserved for that person. You're not a stenographer, don't you? <laughs> I want to uh, hope that my words that I spoke a minute ago are the spirit of this uh, next panel and of the committee, and I want to thank each of you for taking time to be here. Mr. Peters, welcome to the committee. I, I think you've been here once before. But uh, without objection, anything you have in writing, we will enter into the record. And we would yield to the gentleman, Mr. Costa. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of uh, the committee, the ranking member, uh, who's, I guess, not here right now. But all of you uh, have uh, spent a great deal of your time this afternoon listening about the challenges of California facing with a catastrophic drought. Um, and... Um, um, H.R. 3964 is but one of a number of efforts that are attempting to try to address this 
drought that we have. And I guess I might add parenthetically uh, for members of this committee, here we go again, uh, because uh, unfortunately we need to be working together and we're not there yet. I have two amendments that may in part offer that opportunity. You know that this is, uh, and since we've been keeping records, the driest year we've ever had, 13% or less of our snowpack on average. Uh, the fact is, is that our reservoirs that normally have 55 to 65% carryover are at 20% carryover. And this is the third consecutive dry year in a row. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is extremely difficult for every region in California including the regions that Congressman Valadeo, Congressman Nunes, McCarthy, and I represent, which tends to be at ground zero when we have these kinds of conditions. Uh, this, we have a high-pressure system out off the coast, and it doesn't look like that's going to change in the near term. There are 17 water agencies that forecasted that they will not be able to provide drinking water to communities within 30 to 60 days. Uh, and um, so, therefore, we know uh, pretty much unless we have some some rains of biblical proportions, and I guess we would welcome that here in the next two months. It's not likely to happen, though, that we will have a zero allocation for federal contractors under the CVP, and the governor announced Friday that we're going to now have a zero allocation for the state water uh, project as well. And uh, he also announced that uh, there will be cutbacks on areas where they have superior water rights on the Sacramento River Valley, He's indicated that will be cutbacks on a host of waters. We're going to have to ration. That's how serious this is. And uh, the governor, through my and others urging, took uh, executive action three weeks ago that gives him the uh, executive authority to uh, make dramatic uh, changes to, to move around the meager sources of water that we have left available to us. Um, so therefore, I think everybody agrees here, regardless of what your perspective is on how we're going to solve it, this is a real crisis. And Katie, bar the door if we don't get some rain next year, because we'll have no carryover. And it's not just affecting California, it's affecting Nevada, it's affecting many other western states. Now, um, the amendment that I have on this measure, I, there was another version of this that Congressman Nunes had introduced a couple years ago. I supported that although at the time I pointed out that I thought it had problems, and I think this legislation has uh, similar uh, challenges as well. Certainly, uh, Senator Feinstein and, and Boxer have indicated their view. The governor has indicated his view as of yesterday. Uh, if we don't start talking to each other, we're going to get nothing done. And even if this legislation were to become law tomorrow, and I intend to vote for it, uh, unless we get any sort of meaningful rain and snow in the Sierra, it will not bring one more drop of water uh, to the people I represent who are looking at a zero allocation. Titles I and Titles III aim to address one of the biggest challenges in California water policy, and that that federal and state laws have changed, not just with new legislatures, but with different administrations. I applaud uh, Congressman Valadale's efforts to provide flexibility uh, as it relates to the two flawed biological opinions uh, on the Central Valley Improvement Act. Uh, this legislation attempts to go in that direction. It's similar to legislation I introduced last year that didn't get a hearing on more water for California. In wetter years, it would help bring some additional certainty, but it won't address the long-term issues. Um, it's important, though, on my uh, two amendments that will be before the Rules Committee, my First Amendment strikes Title II of the bill before us today. You say, well, why strike Title II? Well, it deals with a complicated 18-year lawsuit that was resolved by the Friant Water Authority uh, some eight, seven years ago. Uh, it was a decision that local government, the local water districts, chose to make because they felt if they didn't resolve this issue, they would lose more water. I would like to submit for the record uh, their statement, they don't support the legislation, but they oppose Section 2 because any day of the week, the Front Water Authority, as a settling party on the enabling legislation, could break the agreement. They don't need this legislation to break the agreement. They're unwilling to break the agreement because they think the alternative would be worse, that they would lose more water. And as a point of fact, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation announced last week that they're going to curtail restoration flows, which have been part of the controversy, 
by the end of this month, and they've already begun cutting dramatically back on those restoration flows. So I think Section 2 is not necessary. More importantly, a key water uh, authority that both uh, Congressman Valadeo, Nunes, and I represent does not think that Section 2 is in their best interest. The final amendment is part of my, as my good friend and colleague from Utah, uh, Mr. Bishop might suggest, my kumbaya moment. It's a time to hold hands and begin to figure out how we might begin to deal with some of the water challenges, or as some people put it, the water wars in California. Because this is one thing that I have found in which we had a little bit of an agreement in the last two weeks. When Speaker Boehner came to uh, Kern County with some of my colleagues, uh, part of the initial proposal, this is the third reiteration, I think, of the proposal, um, was is that they would have a committee by House and Senate to help come together to work with the Drought Task Force. Well, geez, if we can't talk to each other now, maybe we need to, through legislation, create this joint committee so, that in fact, the House and the Senate will begin to get passed what clearly is a logjam, and the logjam exists between this proposed legislation and some other alternative legislation. Uh, I think Senator Feinstein intends to introduce legislation this week. I will probably be working with her, well, I am working with her, on, on that legislation. And uh, at some point, we've got to get past the political posturing. We've got to work together. And my Second Amendment, I think, would at least set the stage for that uh, to take place. Uh, this is the uh, submission by the Friant Water Authority as it relates to Section 2. I don't know who I should hand this to, but I will like it submitted for the record, Mr. Don't Chairman. Put it right there without objection. We'll enter that. And thank you so very much for the time. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the uh, gentleman's comments. The gentleman, Mr. Peters, recognized. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your comments both with respect to tone and with respect to time, so I'll be very brief uh, and uh, respectful, I hope. Um, I w I, my, my amendment that I propose is a very simple one that would just provide, in, in order to allay some of the concern that people have about the redistribution of water effect in their communities, that the Act would not adversely affect any community's water supply or water budget. Nothing we would do in this Act or these amendments would do that. Uh, and uh, I would be happy to submit uh, my comments on the record. The one thing I would mention in response to, to um, Mr. Nunez before was how, how successful urban Southern California has been in terms of making uh, con conservation and investments in storage. In fact, uh, per capita water use has decreased about 27 percent since 2007, and total regional consumption of potable water in 2013 was 24 percent lower than in 2007. Uh, so we're trying to do whatever we can to in Southern California to make sure we address those issues. Uh, with that, I would submit the remainder of my comments in writing. Mr. McClintock. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Just to wrap up the discussion on 3964 and its effect on California water rights, you know, I need to point out that this is identical to uh, H.R. 1837 in that respect that was uh, passed by the uh, House uh, in the last session. Uh, it contained provisions to protect the um, uh, water rights uh, uh, under California law. The Northern California Association of Water Agencies, representing these senior water rights holders, wrote of those provisions. The bill, if enacted, now contains provisions that would not only protect the interests of senior water rights holders in the Sacramento Valley, but would also provide significant material water policy improvements to current federal law. The bill, if enacted, would provide an unprecedented federal statutory express recognition of and commitment to California's state water rights priority system and area of origin protections. This is important for the region to provide sustainable water supplies for productive farmlands, wildlife refuges, and managed wetlands, cities and rural communities, recreation and meandering rivers that support important fisheries." Uh, end of quote. Um, the bill restores the water allocations that were established under the Bay Delta Accord in 1994. When that agreement was signed, Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt assured all parties that, quote, a deal is a deal, and if it turns out there's a need for additional water, it will come at the expense of the federal government. The water diversions for the Delta smelt shattered that promise. This bill simply redeems it. 
Uh, I'd also like to address briefly the uh, timber salvage provisions in H.R. 2954 uh, and uh, to strongly support them. Uh, the Yosemite Rim fire destroyed 400 uh, square miles of forests in my district in the Sierra Nevada. Um, there is an enormous supply of timber that can be salvaged, but only if we act now. Within a year, the value of that timber for salvage declines dramatically. Within two years, it becomes worthless. There was 16,000 acres of privately held land destroyed by that fire. It's not subject to those regulations. The owner of that land is already 60% of the way uh, of sal uh, to, to salvaging all of that timber. Uh, they expect to be uh, done with that uh, by the um, summer. Uh, a portion of that money will go to reforest those privately held 16,000 acres. Meanwhile, the destroyed timber on federal land sits there and it is rotting. It is food for uh, bark beetles. Uh, uh, and uh, the environmental review on it will not be concluded until next August at the earliest, uh, and then the litigation process starts, uh, and uh, that, that timber will become worthless. That's, that's millions of dollars that could be used for uh, forest restoration that will be lost to taxpayers, uh, not to mention all of the jobs uh, that would be lost as well. So the timber salvage uh, portion uh, of the measure is extremely important to the people of my district and I think to the people of the United States. Thank you, Mr. McClintock. Mr. Valadeo. I'll be brief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this debate's been going on for a long time. I've only been in Congress for a year, but as a farmer, this is something that's affected me directly. My one year in Congress, I spent a lot of time reaching out to my senators. Uh, I've actually had quite a few conversations with Senator Feinstein. I've had quite a few conversations with Mr. Costa. This isn't something that we've been hiding from people. 1837 has been debated in the past, and now that's been brought back up under a, a different number, but it still uh, is an important piece of legislation. It's an idea. And it's something that we can bring forward and pass. As soon as the Senate wants to come and bring some ideas to the table to help solve this problem, that's great. As far as what people have done to conserve water around the state, that's great when you see a 20% or 25%. But we're not at a 0% or a 5% cut. We're getting hopefully 5% of our water. We're down to mo many parts of our district 0%. So you can't grow anything with 0%. Our communities are suffering, not just from the unemployment because of the lack of jobs, but they've actually gotten cuts down to 40 and 50% of their contracted amounts. So they're not saving 25%. They're not saving 40%. They're only getting 40%, if not less. So those are some drastic measures that we've been facing, uh, situations in our district that we're fighting to, to repair or make their lives a little easier. Um, we're happy to work across the aisle. We're happy to work across the Capitol. We're going to continue to reach out. But as far as uh, ideas or what's being pushed, we need ideas that fix our problem today. Infrastructure for the future, on board. Let's do it. I, I've been supportive. I, when I served my time in the state legislature, we worked on the water bond. We've, I continue to support that as long as we bring water to the valley. Uh, the, the Bay Delta plan they're working on now, I worked on that as well. Happy to be a voice there. But again, that's another long-term solution. But what helps us get water into the valley to serve these communities today is something that we've tried to address at many different angles from many different approaches. And I worked with uh, Mr. Costa and other members to try to do that th through this past year. But now it's getting to a desperate situation where people need uh, to resolve this. And so that's why we're pushing this forward. And hopefully the Senate will come to the table and start to act with us or, and bring up their ideas and we'll work them out as we go. But the process is pass a bill, negotiate. And then they'll pass a bill and hopefully they'll negotiate. So thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask if any of my colleagues have questions. Mr. Bishop? Yeah, I don't have any other meetings today, so I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> rest, rest of you can just suffer. <laughs> Let me, and I'll try and go through this quickly. What do you mean by restoration flow? What's the definition of that? The Friant Water Authority uh, was sued by the NRDC, um, and um, that was about 20 years ago, 22 years ago, and they were in court for 18 years fighting that uh, uh, suit to return spring-run salmon on the San Joaquin River that haven't run since 1947. And uh, they thought they were going to lose the uh, court decision, and out of their million two acre feet of water that was composed of the 20 districts uh, of the Friant Water Authority, 
they thought settling an out-of-court settlement agreement was better than losing uh, uh, large amounts of well, their contracted water. They made an agreement. We enabled, They needed enabling legislation. They got a superior water contract as a part of that and some other aspects that helped improve the water delivery system of the authority. <clears throat> we enacted that into law in 2008. It was signed. This settlement agreement over the next 10 years, I think the years 2024, would try to establish a spring-run salmon on the San Juan King River. Now, I and others have doubts as to whether or not you can actually do that. Restoration is simply for the fish run that you're talking about. Right. All right. Let me, let, and I don't care who answers these, you're chairman of the subcommittee, whatever comes up with That's that. a separate part of the bill. This is, yes. This is still part, um, is a federal water program that has been established in Central California, right? Right, the Central when, Valley Project. When was that established? Uh, the first uh, part of the Central Valley Project uh, was established uh, back in the 1930s and with the okay. completion of Fry and Dam in 1947. Uh, the Fran Kern Canal uh, moved water from the San Joaquin River south all the way down to Kern right. County. So we're, we're still talking about a federal involvement, federal money. Right. And that's one At of the reasons At the invitation why. of the state of California. Which, which should be a lesson for all of us. Quit inviting the federal government <laughs> in. We screw it up every time we enter there. That's what we're trying to do, definitely, for you. Still states' rights. Um, when was the Delta smelt decision made and implemented? I believe that was 2006. Yeah. Okay. And we're still talking about prioritization of water, with this, where water is being diverted. Right. Okay. But in this case, and there's going to be a zero allocation for the entire federal project and the state water. There's no water. That's, I'm sorry. There's so many good lines I could use. I'm going to refrain from all of them. <laughs> You're saying the bill does give 800,000 acre feet? Yes. It, it, or it, the Delta. It restores the Bay Delta Accord, which guaranteed 800,000 acre feet for the Delta. That's sufficient to maintain the uh, fresh water barrier uh, against uh, uh, salt water. That's salt the water salinity pollution. issue. Exactly. Okay. Let me talk to you now, switch to the real bill, which is the land bill, and talk to you about Yosemite yep. and the acreage that you have down there. This is, this is devastating. Why is it taking the Park Service so long? This, to salvage this, this timber. The, the environmental review on an expedited basis uh, will conclude by August at the very earliest. There is nothing then to prevent litigation, which commonly is then filed by environmental groups that simply runs out the clock. They don't expect to win these suits. They simply expect to run out the clock on them until this uh, timber is worthless for salvage. So the private property that was burned, they have already started and are well on their way. They are 60 percent completed in salvaging their land. But on federal property, we're still going through the process. Nothing unusual. It's just the general bureaucratic lethargy. Uh, oh, no, no, no. If it was a normal bureaucratic lethargy, uh, it would be late fall before they are, are done. They're expediting this under their most expedited plan. The earliest we can expect the environmental review to be completed is August. It may be much later. So, all right, this is an expedited lethargy, which happens with every centralized program. But the opportunity to sue then would take place after that work is done, and that is open-ended. Correct. How, and you said in here, how long can we let this stuff uh, sit before well, after totally a year, ridiculous. after a year, uh, uh, the uh, value of the trees declines dramatically, and and this might be accelerated because you have a uh, a, a dry uh, a period and a lot of bark be beetle activity. They feast on the timber. So and, this would and simply as they mean do, it if we don't go about salvaging this stuff, not only do you not have funds recognized for the reforestation that is necessary, but you also have a whole lot of fuel sitting there on the ground in a drought condition ready to burn. Oh, yes, and, and, and bear in mind, brush uh, has first claim on the uh, destroyed land. So what you'll have uh, over the next several years if we don't salvage and reforest is about four to uh, five feet of dry brush. After a couple years, those dead trees, because we haven't salvaged them, will start tumbling on top of that dried brush. Uh, now you have a perfect fire stack uh, for the next bolt of lightning or careless campfire. You then have a second generation fire that is much more intense, absolutely sterilizes and sears the land. If we simply leave nature to its own, the forest will eventually return, but it will not return within our lifetimes, our children's, or our children's children. We're talking about a century or more. 
uh, for the natural process to restore that forest. Uh, by salvaging that timber now, we can produce the money to provide reforestation. We're seeing that on the 16,000 acres of private land, and in a couple of years, I would hate to look back on this and say, here's a beautiful new forest on the private land. The public lands uh, are now a tinderbox, um, uh, and, and that is a complete failure of management of the federal government over the public lands. By my definition, that's one of the reasons why this package of bills on the second bill, they need to go. It is essential. We move forward and we cannot wait on them. Both that as well as the Green Forest reason because of the court decision, the rest of them, they're, it's, it's a package that is time is well past due. Yeah. I appreciate you and I will yield back again. Jim yields back his time. It's my understanding I was gone for about two minutes and found out that uh, I was advised by the staff that Mrs. Fox is far more efficient than I am. When I sit in the chair, everybody likes to talk and ask questions and quite generally enjoy themselves, and that Mrs. Fox did not allow that. So with great, with great sympathy to me and to you, I'm back. But Mrs. Fox, thank you very much. I want to thank this panel, and once again, in the spirit in which we alluded to uh, each of you, and it's my hope that you had an opportunity today to come and present your case. This panel is now excused. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This now, uh, I do not see any other members that seek recognition. So the hearing portion uh, of this uh, HR 295, no, HR. 2954, it was HR 2954, is now closed, and the chairman will be in street of motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant HR 2954 to authorize Escambia County, Florida, to convey certain property that was formerly part of Santa Rosa Island National Monument, and that was conveyed to Escambia County subject to restrictions on use and reconveyance a structured rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule makes an order as original text for the purpose of amendment and amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 113-35 and provides that it shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against said amendment in the nature of substitute. The rule makes in order only those further amendments printed in Part A of the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in Part A of the report. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2 of the rule provides for consideration of H.R. 3964, the Sacramento-San Joaquin Valley Emergency Water Delivery Act under a structured rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule makes an order as original text for the purpose of amendment, an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of text of Rules Committee print 113-34 and provides that it shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against that amendment in the nature of a substitute. The rule makes an order only those further amendments printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in Part B of the report. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instruction. You've now heard the motion by the gentlewoman from North Carolina, the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mrs. Fox, and I would defer to the gentleman from Utah uh, for an explanation of the rule. The gentleman is recognized. Okay, so you have two bills going under the same rule. 
the lands bill has only five amendments that were made in order, one by a Democrat, four by the Republicans, but on the water one, um, the eight amendments that are made in order are all Democratic amendments. Uh, most of the other amendments, many of the other amendments submitted have subject to point of order. So it's a sign of, kind of a straightforward rule for consideration on two very important bills. You've now heard the motion and an explanation by the gentleman from uh, Utah. Is there uh, amendment or discussion? Gentleman from Massachusetts. Yeah, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I, ha I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee grant H.R. 2954 and H.R. 3964 open rules so that all members have the opportunity to offer amendments to these bills on the floor. You now heard the uh, amendment by the gentleman from Massachusetts. Those in uh, further discussion? Those in favor of signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Noes have it, noes have it, no. Further amendment or discussion? Seeing none, seeing none, the uh, vote will now be on the motion from the gentlewoman from North Carolina. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it, ayes have it. On that, we ask for a recorded vote. Recorded votes requested. Ms. Fox. Aye. Ms. Fox, aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Nugent. Mr. Nugent, aye. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, aye. Ms. Ross Leighton. Aye. Ms. Ross Leighton, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Burgess, aye. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings. Hey. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Polis, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, three nays. Uh, the um, the uh, motion is agreed to, is agreed to, and the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop, will be handling for Republicans. And the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, will be handling and for Democrats. And the gentleman, Judge Hastings, will be handling this for the Democrats. I uh, want to offer my thanks to the committee uh, handling uh, intrastate issues are hard. This was a uh, effort that was well done, I think, by both sides, and I appreciate your help. And uh, we have no further work scheduled for a meeting for the Rules Committee, so you have earned your time off. This ends the committee hearing. Thank you.